Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up long forgotten creatures and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition D&D game. I'm your host, Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're talking about a creature that comes to us from the long, long ago, the days of AD&D. I'm sure we're all familiar with the concept of the Mimic, loved by DMs and hated by players worldwide, but what if I told you there was a relative of the Mimic that didn't imitate something as simple as a mere chest or object? A relative of the Mimic that imitated something as big as an entire structure. The House Hunter Mimic is just that, and it is glorious. I do want to apologize to anyone who stumbled across this video and was expecting to see footage of boring humans looking for a reasonably priced abode near a good school, but if you are part of that crowd, please Stick around, I guarantee you this will be much more interesting. You asked for Colonial, and I deliver. <laughs> you have! <laughs> it looks cute! So as always, we're going to talk about what this thing can do in battle, and of course some practical applications for how you want to use it in your game. So without further ado... Now before we get into specifically what attacks and ability this creature has, I did just want to point out that this creature comes in three separate varieties, each of which is determined by how old it is. We've got young, adult, and ancient house hunters. They're CR 5, 7, and 10 respectively. And of course I have made a stat block for all three of them, so this should give you some good coverage if you want to actually use this monster in your game. I only mention this now just because, as you're about to see, they do get a lot nastier as they get older. To start things off, let's talk about the Young House Hunter. These creatures aren't capable of speech, but they do have a telepathic link within 100 miles of any other House Hunter, so they can communicate that way. They're large in size for a creature, but when it comes to what size of structure they can actually take the appearance of, you're looking at smaller buildings like a woodshed or specifically as mentioned by the book, an outhouse. Like all House Hunters, they have a move speed of 10 feet, and they're not only resistant to acid damage like most other mimics, but they're also resistant to cold and fire. This is due to the fact that their outer shell, which is basically the walls of the structure they're taking the appearance of, is quite durable and resistant to damage. Their ability to mimic an object, in this case a structure, works exactly the same as the mimic's ability to look like a chest. They can switch between that form and a slightly more amorphous form that allows them to walk around and do things. In their amorphous form, they still take on a lot of the features of the house that they were pretending to be just moments ago go. However, it's quite clear that they are in fact some kind of creature if you want to even call them that moving around. Also, like the regular Mimic, they have that same adhesive that everyone's come to know and love, meaning that if they hit you with an attack, you are automatically grappled and they have advantage on any attacks they make on you after you're grappled. Fairly nasty stuff. As far as attacks go, they've got that pseudopod slam, which is basically just reaching out and grabbing and attacking someone with one of their slimy tentacles, and they also have a bite attack. And the mouth of most house hunters is in fact the front door, so they're going to grab you and chomp down on you that way. Now unlike regular smaller mimics, these creatures have the ability to swallow their prey. If they're grappling someone, they can make another bite attack against them, and if that bite attack succeeds, they can then swallow that creature whole. While inside the house hunter, a creature is going to take a bunch of acid damage. They're effectively blocked blinded and restrained since they can't really move around much and are more or less confined to the 5 foot square they're placed in. Their only hope of escape is if the house hunter is killed before they are, or if from the inside they can manage to do enough damage to force the house hunter to make a constitution save. If they do this and the house hunter fails its save, it regurgitates them out. Of course this doesn't mean they can't get swallowed again, but they're free for the time being. The other thing these creatures can do, which is very unique, is they have the ability to mimic not only sounds, but sights as well of what you might see in a regular house. This could be anything from shadows walking by openings in a window, perhaps, or lights flickering from underneath the crack in the front door. And they can even imitate the sounds of muffled conversation, people walking around, hens clucking, a bird playing an instrument, whatever would be appropriate for the kind of structure it's pretending to be. Now, when we get to the adult house hunter, this is where things start to get a little more interesting. Of course, it's much bigger in size, it's a huge creature, so this is going to be like a small house or perhaps a small tavern. And once they reach the adult phase, these guys actually learn how to speak common. Mind you, it's specified that it's very broken and rough common, but presumably they've been alive long enough and eaten enough creatures that they've picked up a thing or two. In addition to that, they are now big and powerful enough that their pseudopod tentacle attacks constrict their targets. Meaning that if you get grappled by one of these things, the worst thing that happens isn't going to be you taking an attack with advantage from them the next round. They actually get to continuously constrict a grappled target, causing even more damage. And then of course we move on to the ancient model. These creatures are colossal in size and have no limit to how big they can actually be. So this could be something as big as a mansion or even a castle. They don't inherit any new abilities at this point, 
but due to their increased size and age, they gain a lot more hit points and they're a lot harder to kill. And of course, they're going to deal a whole bunch more damage. Now, these creatures do have sunlight sensitivity. They're not actually damaged by sunlight like some other creatures, but they do have disadvantage when fighting in the broad but they do have disadvantage when fighting in broad daylight. Because of this, they generally prefer to operate at night. And I say they because it specifies in the book that house hunters are pack animals. They generally like to travel in groups, and the adult or ancient house hunters kind of lay their eggs by burying holes in the ground and depositing what grows into a new small structure. Although that said, if you wanted to use just one of these things, there's nothing stopping you from doing so. Which brings me to my next topic. The amount of things you can do with these creatures is just insane. They're so cool and unique and just generally weird. You could use one of these to literally just replicate the plot of Monster House, a movie that I've been showing some clips from throughout this video. In case you haven't seen that movie, basically there's a house in a suburban area that is a monster house. That's pretty much all you need to know. In the context of a DD and d game, perhaps there's an ancient cursed house in town, and the players have been sent to deal with it, and it ends up being a house hunter mimic. Or if you want to go with the idea of them being pack creatures, perhaps a small village just shows up overnight on the outskirts of town. Or maybe the players just stumble across this village out in the middle of nowhere. Upon further investigation, there's no people in the town, it's just a bunch of buildings. And if they go there at night, well, then they might become prey for the house hunters. Getting back to using just a lone creature though, you could totally have one of these show up just in the middle of the desert or on top of a mountain, just somewhere that a house shouldn't be. And the players might go into it thinking it's some kind of a trap, but when the structure springs to life and tries to kill them, that's something they probably won't be expecting. Another option is having this creature not necessarily as a villain or antagonist. Perhaps the players do stumble across a totally vacant village, only to find out that all the structures are these house hunter mimics. At first they might think they're in trouble, but maybe the structures actually used to be the villagers, and they've all been cursed by a green hag or some other kind of villain. One of the older houses that can actually speak common approaches the party and asks for their help. But the other possibility, again going down this friendly NPC route, is to have an ancient house hunter who's maybe a giant castle or some kind of huge structure. Perhaps it's just happy with its life, but unfortunately monsters have taken up residence inside of it. And there's no way to really deal with this problem, since it can't very well go inside itself and root out the creatures. So maybe it asks for the party's help and in return promises some kind of treasure it has stored inside one of its compartments. Alternatively, an ancient house hunter could be working in conjunction with a villain. Maybe it's allowing itself to be used as a lair by the villain who's occupying it maybe as a fort or something like that. In that kind of case, the dungeon crawl then becomes harder because the structure is actually working against the players. Maybe those locked and fortified doors happen to become unlocked just when the monsters show up. Fighting against a dungeon with a sentience that is actively working against the party can be a really interesting twist on a classic dungeon crawl. And speaking of using this creature in conjunction with villains, maybe the party is storming the evil king's castle and is getting ready to take him on in what's going to be the final boss fight. Maybe the final boss is not just the king himself, but also his castle that springs to life as a colossal monster. I really like this creature specifically for Halloween adventures. It just kind of has that fun monstrous vibe to it, but even just in a general campaign, I think that this creature could be really fun to use. And the sky is basically the limit when it comes to how creative you want to get with actually using the creature in your game. So that's pretty much all I've got on this creature today. If you enjoyed listening to me talk about murderous houses and you want to hear me talk about more stuff in the future, please subscribe to the channel. I've got at least one new video every week, usually a couple, and within the next two days, I'm going to be releasing my massive combat video. The video everyone's been asking for for such a long time, so definitely check that out. And if you are one of the few people out there who uses this thing called social media, I definitely encourage you to check out the description below. I've got Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, Discord, all that good stuff. And if you really like what I do here and you want to support the channel in a bigger way, Please check out my Patreon, which you can also find a link to in the description below. I definitely wouldn't be able to do any of this without your guys' support, so thank you so much for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I will see you next week.